<laughs> Happy birthday again, by the way. Thank you so much. Thank you yeah. so much. Hey, Carmen and Lynn, it's so good to see you guys. <laughs> She's the best at putting these signs up. You know, you want to hang around Carmen. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, these birthdays, man, they're coming faster and faster, you know. And uh, I just prayed, Lord, I, you know, I thought, I think about all the years I squandered, you know, and I say, Lord, just let me keep running and keep uh, running this race and finish it well. And so 65 is today. And uh, I'm just 65. Getting 65. You don't look it's a day a over. Young lady. <laughs> Zoom does a wonderful thing, by the way. <laughs> keep zooming, right? Keep zooming. Yeah, thank you so much. What well, you know, I, I told Doug when we first met, you know, my body gets old, it's already old, but my spirit won't get old, you know, my heart won't get old. And so, you know, that has something to do with it, I guess. Just being joyful. Yeah. But it's it's been good. So uh so uh Carol, Mary, you gotten into any trouble yet or yes? <laughs> every <laughs> minute of every day. Yeah, <laughs> Carol wasn't gonna answer me. <laughs> That's so awesome. That's so awesome. What's your weather like today? Shorts and t-shirts. Oh, shut up. Okay. Jackets Fine. and long pants. <laughs> Sorry, I asked. Shorts and t-shirts. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I'm taking off my my wrap. <laughs> you got me going. <laughs> you got me going. Hey Suzanne, how you doing, my friend? She'll probably come on. She's probably on the road here. Uh, hadn't been able to keep herself away, away from her grandchild. <laughs> she hadn't been home hardly at all after that baby came into the world. Uh, well, so. One of the things I do for my kids is I, I have for years. Uh, on their birthday, I call them mm -hmm. at the time they were born, and then I sing happy birthday to them. And, um, and uh, you know, they, they don't know what to do if I don't call them. And, and do that and uh, although one of my sons begs me every year please please dad don't, don't. <laughs> but i know if i didn't he would be so disappointed oh of course yeah. <laughs> so i'm i'm offering that to you because it is your birthday today and and i would be more than happy to sing happy birthday to you the way i sing it to them oh well i would love to hear that you so you go on with it all right happy birthday to you Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Lynn. Happy birthday to you. And many, many more. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> Thank you so much. Tell tell your kids I'll go on with that. I'll take that anytime. <laughs> I hope I'll have lots and lots more, you know, out with Methuselah. And you can sing that forever and ever. Amen. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. We had a good time uh, last night. We actually celebrated yesterday with the family. And what I like to do, uh, you know, with all the locals, at least, is decorate the Christmas. I like to be with them. And so uh, it was really a great time. And sorry, I'm letting people in. Um, we had a great time. And the kids, you know, put these clumps of, you know, ornaments here and there. And when they're not looking, we kind of straighten them out. And uh, we have a lot of, um, you know, I, I hand paint ornaments for me each year. And so they're memory ornaments. And so... We kind of, you know, I want to go over that and everything. Anyway, it looked magnificent and everybody's ooing and aahing and just admiring the tree. And then all of a sudden, boom, it goes over. <laughs> really? Wow. And it went over right on Judah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like screeching. I think the men were in the kitchen, but nonetheless, you know, we're screaming, oh my gosh. And, and all of a sudden you see this four-year-old come out doing an army crawl, right? And belly laughing. <laughs> <laughs> like, we think, oh my gosh he's going to be hurt and traumatized and he's laughing and he came into the kitchen a little bit later and says grandma why was everybody screaming and i said well we were afraid you were hurt and he said i wasn't hurt it was funny <laughs> i crawled out of the tree oh my goodness so it sat there it was a little tired and discouraged i said well we got the tree back up but all the ornaments on the ground but the lord is so good because we have i have just a very few, I mean, just a handful of um, glass ornaments, you know, most of them are wood or whatever. And, uh, you know, it, one of them was made by a friend of mine who passed away three years ago. She hand painted a goose egg and it was a treasure of mine, right? And sure enough, that stinking goose egg was down there. I couldn't have gotten one of the wooden ones, right? 
and, and, and I was a little discouraged. And then after the kids like, mom, you know, it's okay. And after they left, I went rummaging through the trash can. <laughs> Somebody, they all picked up the broken pieces and put them in the trash can. And I said, oh my goodness, because God saved the front side of that goose egg. And so I'm so grateful I'll be able to repair the goose egg. Isn't it funny how little things like that, but uh, what a treasure of a friend she was. I look forward to seeing her in heaven one day. And that was a precious gift to me. So the Lord salvaged that part of the goose egg. Isn't that sweet? But anyway, we survived, Judah survived. And yeah, I told you they were uh, their memory ornaments. So this year, no doubt, their ornaments gonna have a Christmas tree of belly down, <laughs> a four-year-old doing the army crawl coming out of there. So that's <laughs> good, God is good. He is so good. So anyway, um, we're gonna get on with the message tonight. It's funny, it's uh, it's entitled <laughs> oh, oh, Christmas Tree. And I can't begin to tell you how many times, uh, p- how many messages I got, a lot of birthday messages. And then they would say, by the way, you spelled you spelled tree wrong. I said, oh no, I didn't spell tree. I, I it wouldn't surprise me if I spelled it wrong, but it is oh Christmas three. So to get us going, to have anybody uh, willing to open us up in prayer? Okay. I think that's what you meant. Okay, Michael, go ahead. Okay, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for Lynn having another day, another year with us, and going on to many, many, many more. We thank you for the messages that you give to her to pass on to us, because they are always words that we need to hear, things that we need to do, and things that we need to be aware of, to be part of your uh, children and, and bring that message to the rest of the world. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us each and every Sunday evening to be with Lynn, to hear your word, to hear exactly which direction you want us to go, what it is that you need us to do, and how we can perform these things in your name and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah, no, you know, I I treasure my family. I treasure the time. I treasure so many things in this life, but there's nothing I'd rather be doing, especially on my birthday and opening the word of God. And so it's, it's my, it's my blessing. I thank you so much for that, Michael. So let me get on and see if I can't find my screen, have a blonde moment here. Right. And uh, it's an interesting uh, message. And it's so weird how um, I, I was just looking at headline news. I have you know news feeds for different things out there, and and I was looking at the news feeds. And I said, look at you, look at him. He's talking to the world, right? We got the same message going on, pretty much as we head toward Christmas. And you know, we like to treasure. You guys can see there you go, little baby Jesus in the manger behind me. And uh, uh, you know, we, we certainly it's a time for the oh, everybody out. Okay. Uh, it's certainly time that we focus on the birth of our Savior. What amazing thing. Even though we don't know what day he was really born, uh, unlike Michael's family, we don't know what time he was born, what day he was born, but our hope was born and uh, in under humble circumstances. We were talking this morning about how that makes the... Um, the well so special, you know, I uh, just to think about the, the humble side of it, right? We're meeting in a barn and it's a beautiful thing because I think often about how my savior was born in humble circumstance. But sometimes, you know, we focus a little bit too much on that sweet, beautiful bundle of joy, uh, beautiful baby Jesus, you know, but that that little lamb became the lion. And when he comes back, he's going to come back fighting. And so, uh, you know, I want to take a, few, a look at a few things today. But anyway, uh, we uh, oh Christmas three is a focus on three. It's very interesting. Uh, the number three, um, it signifies co- either completion, unity or perfection. And it's mentioned in the Bible 467 times. Who knew, right? And a few key examples, I'm sure you can think of many of them in your mind as I'm reading over what we have here, but uh, the three persons of God, of course, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. We know that Noah had three sons, very significant, and in the rebuilding of the world, right? Uh, there were three fathers of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How beautiful it is to, to think when we pray to God that we're praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? The Ark of the Covenant had three uh, objects, three, you know, a gold jar of of manna, Aaron's budded staff, and the tablets, the commandments, right? Three things. Daniel prayer, uh, pr- prayed three times a day. 
Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days. And according to the law, men had to present themselves at the temple three times a year. Satan tempted Jesus three times in the wilderness. And, and it, it certainly goes on and on and on, doesn't it? You know, uh, uh, Jesus was risen on the third day. And, and we know that Peter denied Jesus three times. G, uh, Jesus restored uh, uh, Peter, you know, symbolically three times. So the number three is goes on and on. I was telling our group this morning, it's so fascinating as we hit these things that you know maybe uh, sometime over the holidays after christmas maybe you search and look how many times it mentions the number three and the and the symbolism you know of, of that unity completion perfection so the scripture that we're looking at tonight is matthew 2 uh, so i'll read over it i hope you read with me um, after jesus was born in bethlehem and judea during the time of king herod magi from the east came to jerusalem and asked where is the one who has been born, born king of the Jews? Uh, we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. That's a, putting it lightly, right? If you study the word for that, it means he was enraged, you know, and all of Jerusalem with them. You know, the king's not happy. We're not happy, right? And when he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they were they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. And of course, we know everything is prophesied. And um, I was sharing also this morning that, you know, you can see Jesus in every book of the Bible. It's very, it's fascinating. I'll share that sometime uh, with you. But, uh, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd my people Israel. So, you know, this is the prophecy that uh, they're foretelling or telling. And then Herod called the Magi secretly, right? He wants to get them in a closed corner, maybe influence them a little bit, and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. <laughs> right. And they had, when they, after they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where Jesus was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother. Of course, here they are in that, uh, you know, barn, if you will, uh, Mary. And they bowed down to worship. Isn't it beautiful how they knew? I mean, we're on this side of things. We know Jesus was born. We know that Jesus, uh, you know, lived his life, died. He was resurrected. We know all these. We're on this side of things. But here they are based on prophecy, you know, and, and when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And then when they opened, when they saw him, they, they hit their knees and worshiped him. What a beautiful thing, right? Only, only the Holy Spirit could do that. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, right? He's the bad guy. They returned uh, to their country by a different route to avoid him. We did a little bit of a teaching on these guys last year. And, uh, you know, it's, it's out there on YouTube if you wanted to watch it again. But, uh, you know, these, these guys are key players, obviously. But as you look at that scripture, you can see uh, the, th the number three being used. There are three kinds of people. So the first set of three are the, are the different kinds of people. The, there are those who are hostile to Jesus. Boy, we see it, right? We, uh, Herod was hostile to Jesus. There are those who are, are indifferent to Jesus. And that's the thing that keeps me my fire in my belly, right? Wake up, wake up. You know, that is indifferent to Jesus. And those are, there are those who uh, will worship Jesus. So first things first, before we break that down, you know, there's one uh, scripture I had, I couldn't pick a favorite really, uh, but I love this one from Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it springs the issues of life. And so, you know, it, you, we know you hear me talk a lot about the, the Lord requires action. It's never just like, hey, I got it. No, you keep your heart with diligence so it's a guard it and keep it you know because what's gonna you know come out of it is the are the issues of life we are responsible for guarding our heart with diligence not just a little bit not playfully put you know prayerfully but but with diligence guard your heart because uh, out of our hearts will spring those issues of life so you see it it's always a heart problem so if you look at every situation everything in the world everything in your world everything anywhere right the root cause it always comes down to a heart issue it always is it always will be so there's something in the human heart that keeps us from you know being the people we want to be uh, paul certainly expressed that the very things i want to do i don't do the things i don't want to do i do you know it's a, it's a it's a, a daily 
daily struggle. It's a daily sanctification, right? It's a daily searching for truth. So we, we don't, you know, we can become the people we want to be, that we know we ought to be, that we know we should be, right? It, it's a, a, a lack of compassion or love, maybe, or lack of wanting to involve ourselves in the lives of other people. We see that a lot this year. In fact, I'm, I'm not always kind when I say this. I don't mean to be unkind. But, you know, this time of year is a time when uh, people come out of the woodwork, as they say, you know, to serve in a soup kitchen or uh, be part of an angel tree process or whatever. But where are, where are people on the average day? Feels good to do it at the holidays. That's a that's a I feel good when I do that. But where are we, you know, when people are in need and, and, we, and we don't serve them? So when we think about these three types of people, it's important for us not to just think about the thousands of years ago. Right. It's not just history. It's true for us today. It's where we are today. And you're going to see. Uh, people in your life, maybe it's you, but you're going to see yourself in these people. First kind is, of course, the hostile to Jesus, right? I tell you what, you know, it's certainly out there, right? Uh, it, you, I hear it. I'm sure you hear it. People are hostile toward Jesus. And in this story, of course, King Herod is hostile, right? You couldn't get any more hostile than that guy. He's he's really uh, over everything. When he hears that the king of the Jews, you know, that I would imagine he thought even the, the mention of it, even a hint of it, even if he thought it was impossible that the king of the Jews could be born when he heard about it, that was it. You know, he, he was probably thinking that kid's going to challenge my my power structure. So I got to do some people are actually looking for this for this child. So you find later in the Gospels that when the Magi, the, the wise men don't go back to hear it, he persecutes children. Right. In an attempt, he, he's basically saying, I don't know where he is, but I'm going to kill them all until I find him and do away with him. What a horrible thing. Right. He, he didn't want uh, anything to rival his throne. When we see that hostility today, we we hear it in, mo in modern music. We hear people mocking God. We see witchcraft and Satanism just rising up. This hostility toward Jesus, and that's a common thing, right? The more you're out there in your faith, the more you'll hear that hostility, that bitterness. Uh, you know, I would imagine somewhat like the the heart of King Herod, the threat. I, I was a reminder again this morning saying, you know, the mention of the name Jesus Christ, it, it makes a demon shudder. So you hear me say it a lot. I hope you're saying it more and more. The, the, the carding around of a holy Bible for people to see, not this pretty, uh, you know, dressed up cover on it or on your smartphone, but we need to be out there. And so you'll, you'll see more hostility the more you're out there. Many people today are absolutely hostile toward Jesus, but Jesus is intimidating to the, the personal power to some. I know that uh, I was hostile before I came to Jesus. You know, I was just like, those Jesus freaks are everywhere. I felt like he was hunt hunting me down like a hungry dog everywhere I went, right? And I was hostile until he used circumstances to soften my heart. So there are all sorts of people that will tell you that, you know, I can't believe you believe that stuff. We even have people uh, in the pulpit saying, well, you know, this is just a good story here. You know, it's a parable. It's not really, didn't really happen. You know, they break the whole thing down. You know, basically that's showing hostility with a pretty picture all around it, right? But, you know, they'll tell you why you shouldn't believe in Jesus. They'll dissect the word of God. They'll alter the word of God. And uh, all because they're hostile toward Jesus. And then there are the indifferent ones, the ones that get, get, keep me on my knees, the ones that keep me going, right? But first, let's look at that. The definition, again, of indifferent on the right side is unconcerned, not curious, aloof, detached, not showing or feeling interest. So indifference, you know, implies neutrality of attitude. And boy, do we see that. That's that lukewarm thing. That's that complacent thing, right? So there are plenty of people. It's scary how many people are really indifferent to Jesus. You know, there are, uh, in this account, the chief priests and the scribes were indifferent. You know, the Magi come seeking Jesus and they knew where he was born, but the scribes and chief, they don't want to go there. They have no interest in going there. They're indifferent. They're curious. We want to know if it happened. We want to know what you saw. Come back and give us a scoop. But, the, but they didn't chase after. There was nothing there. So many people today who are indifferent to Jesus, you know, they're not showing or feeling interest. They're not panting like a deer pants for water. They're not hungry for his word. They're not uh, eager to be in his word so he can mold them and shape them and refine them and ultimately use them. And so there are plenty of people out there indifferent to Jesus. So the people the mo people that were the most indifferent to Jesus, it was true today, uh, that is true today, are the religious ones. You know, we say it more and more, don't we? Somebody will say, oh, you're very religious. Like, now nah, I'm not religious at all. You know, we, we say it all the time. You know, be, it's because these people know the scriptures, you know, uh, they knew that he was to be born in Bethlehem. They heard he was born. They say, 
we know what the scriptures say, but we actually don't want to meet him. We, we, we don't care to meet him, right? What is that, right? On this side of things, we say, wow, the chance to go meet him. So it's easy to use religion as a way to keep Jesus at arm's length, isn't it? We can use that uh, legalism, if you will, that, that, that religion, all, all these rules, like a Pharisee kind of thing. Well, why is that? Well, because religion and the gospel of Jesus are, are different from one another, very, very different. And when you walk a life and you live a life for him and not just with him as a rule taker and a judge, right? It's a whole different picture. You know, religion says, I obey God, therefore he accepts me, right? I, <laughs> it's living by the rules. I obey the rules of course he accepts me you know basically a, almost an entitled kind of mentality and you've seen it we see it today in the modern church right almost this entitlement because i you know i obey god so he's going to roll out the red carpet for me but you know when it's that's contrary to the gospel you know we we, we say you know he i am accepted therefore i respond to god by obeying right it's it's knowing that he sought us out you know what a beautiful thing to think you know we talk about eternity you guys are stuck with me it's not just another year <laughs> you guys got me forever and that's the bad news right but what we talk about that but the, the it's so amazing to pause for just a minute and say god wants to spend eternity with me he sought me out he bought me with his blood he wants to spend eternity with me it's not just one-sided right he seeks his people he wants his people how beautiful is that how how could we not be in his word not be on our knees when we really ponder that when we realize we're accepted no matter what we do you know and now all of a sudden god's not in, in our debt like that you know the the religious ones you know we just and we just come by you know just we just come and we say thank you and we want to serve him and we want to show him how much we we appreciate him calling us to himself. The religious leaders were indifferent, no doubt. They knew he, the, he was born and they just didn't want to go near him. Didn't have to, why do I need to go, right? What's the big deal? But you know what's interesting? A lot of people are also indifferent to Jesus, not because they're religious, because they're spiritually apathetic man sometimes i want to get a cattle prod out there and say you know come on show me something you know they're, they're spiritually apathetic it's just nothing not there it's just kind of that you know hum, they just stay in one mode one zone uh their radar just doesn't seem to move their 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 passion doesn't seem to flurry up you know they're just spiritually apathetic we know uh that that he is god we know that he was born we we know that he died on a cross we know he was resurrected on the third day but for whatever reason it doesn't move the heart of the indifferent people and you see it i see it every day right what is that well, I often say, you know, it comes down to love and uh, that heart issue, right? When you're in love with Jesus, it shows. There's no indifference. There's no apathy. When you're in love with him, it shows. You can't get enough of him. You hunger and you thirst for him. So there's no room for the indifferent. So imagine, you know, uh, if you had some sort of life-threatening illness, and let's say you had a transplant, right? Uh, it, 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 that person is saying, I'm willing to take a risk and take a risk on my life, you know, take a risk that I might regret giving you a donor or organ, right? Uh, to give you, to save your life. I'm willing to do that to save your life. So are you going to be different, indifferent to that person, you know, that gave you a body part so you could live? Are you going to say, oh yeah, whatever, you know, uh, it's great, you know, thanks a lot, see you next time, right? I don't think so. You're going to think about that person. You're going to be grateful for that person, for the sacrifice they made that helped you live life, right? And so why would it be different with God when somebody's willing to give up their their life so you can have life that's going to impact your heart there's no way around it and so that's really what we're looking at so again intellectually we know uh he he was prophesied about he was born we know he he lived 33 years he was crucified he rose we know all that that's head stuff but does our heart flutter as we think he gave up everything for me you know the way we would in in the, in, the, in the flesh you know so um you know you, you might spend the rest of your life thinking i need to live differently because somebody gave up everything so I might be here. And that's why if, if you're here today and you're indifferent to Jesus, you have to say, God, why is my heart indifferent to Jesus? Why am I not feeling more? So you seek these things out, guys. And again, you know, the more you're in the word, the more he can work with you. The more you're in the word, the more the Holy Spirit can talk to you, the way he can refine you. If you guys follow uh, any of my morning posts, you see that a lot. You know, when the Lord first had me posting out there, I would have people reaching out saying, you know, you're too hard on yourself or, you know, you, you, you always talk about the dark thing. Well, the world's thinking world's full of dark things. I fought dark things. I 
fight, fight those fiery darts every day. And so, you know, I know what it is to be without him. I know what it is to have him. And I know what it is to go before him. And as Denise would say, get taken to the spiritual woodshed. I know what that's like, but you know, I want that because it, I can't grow unless that happens. And so we need to be in his word. So we never have that risk of that apathetic thing. And then the last, of course, are the worshipers of Jesus. So then the third, um, those who have come to worship him, of course, the wise men, the magi, they, they've come to worship him, right? That's what they want to do. They're seeking after him the way you and I should be. They don't stop until they find him the way we should be. They'll find him. The, that, 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 the whole thought of that should keep us witnessing to people. I want you to find Jesus. I want to show you the way to Jesus. I want to be like that bright star that leads the way to Jesus, right? And when they find Jesus, we find that they had lavish gifts upon him. So I ask you today, you know, where do you find yourself? You know, are, is not, you're not hostile. You know, are, are you indifferent? Are, are, are you worshiping? Is it a daily thing? Is it a struggle thing? Or, you know, well, how does that look for you? Um, or, or have you come to that full fullness of your faith where you worship Jesus and you're hungry to worship him and all that you are and all that you do? And then there are three types of revelation here. So uh, we find that uh, the word revelation in Greek uh, and I'm going to twist this up. It's a tongue tire for me, but uh, apocalypsis, which is where we get the word apocalypse. Now, uh, isn't that interesting, right? When you think about apocalypse, you think of the end of the world, don't you? We think about these, uh, I don't even know what these uh, shows are about, like Walking Dead and all this crazy stuff, right? End of the world stuff. But you know what the word apocalypse actually means? It means to open a present to open a box to see what's inside. How beautiful is that? So we hear that word, we don't even know what it means, right? Right now and beyond you know, Christmas, every single moment of your life, God wants to open up that gift. It's not just now when we look at baby Jesus in the manger. He, he, he wants to open up that present of who he is, you know, in, into each one of us. That's what he wants. He wants to spend eternity with you. And he wants to be as close to you as he can possibly get. God wants to reveal, your, reveal himself to in and through our lives. And, and in this passage, we see the three types of the apocalypse, right? The three types of presence that are being unpacked for us. The general revelation, the specific revelation, and then personal revelation. So let's look at the first one, general. General revelation is that star they saw. You know, it, it's basically when we can look out to nature and, and we know that God did it something, something um, what do they say? A, a power greater than me, right? That, that whitewashed uh, version of what God is, right? But, but they saw the star and, and it was the star that precipitated thing. They began their journey uh, of the wise man. It's the, it's the way God reveals himself in nature, in what he created. You know, he made the stars. He, uh, you know, scattered them in the sky. He knows them each by name. That just is a marvel. I can never get tired of thinking about. Do you realize that everything God has created, uh, you reveal something about who God is. So that's a general revelation you see him you see him in the birds and in the deer and in the trees and in the sunrise and the stars and the moon it's a general confirmation uh, almost like a, a whisper from heaven saying i am god and this is what i created right and so in this case the magi saw the star and that's a general revelation then there's a specific revelation um and that the magi said the king of the jews was born in bethlehem so the specific revelation is god's word the bible from genesis to revelation again you can find jesus in every book of the bible god real reveals himself specifically to the wise man this is when he's going to be born this is where he's going to be born this is where you go to see him being born right and and they send a star to take him there and i believe god wants to reveal himself specifically to each one of us individually and collectively as a church so he does that but the reason god uh, doesn't only just give us a general a revelation but but more specific ones is he knows if he does it doesn't tell us who, you know who he is specifically if he doesn't outline and say this is my nature this is how i roll we're going to make up our own ideas about God. We see it every day, you know, and not only will we make up our own ideas, but we're going to make God after our own image. Now that sounds harsh, but I want you to stay with me for a second. You see, but because if it's left up to us, the average human being is going to make God just like them. 
and, 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 and liking who they like. You know, though people will justify, you know, who they like and who they hate, and what they do. Well, you know, right, God's okay. What are you talking about? The, the authority is the word of God, not, not trying to make God into, you know, following your belief system or you, the way you roll. So we, we think God likes who we like or hate, you know, he think we should, he should hate who we hate or, you know, value what we value and devalue what we don't, what we devalue. We, we put God in that box. We think he thinks like us, but he says, you know, nobody knows the mind of God. We never will. Right. And so, but, you know, unless he's specific and unless he, unless you are in the word, you realize that he's a righteous God. Jesus did not replace God. You know, the compassion side of the whole, you know, birth of Christ and the, and the death and resurrection, the redemption and all the in-betweens, right? It isn't just that God went away. He's still a God of wrath. We're supposed to, still supposed to live out our faith with fear and trembling. That will keep you on your toes and keep you on your knees, right? And instead of putting him in this box, so we want God to be just like us in so many ways. We want to be able to fortify what we value by saying, that's where God is. That's what God thinks. God doesn't like those people either. You need to zip it. And remember that Job got in trouble for that, didn't he? Who are you to presume to know the mind of God? You know, who are you that darkens my counsel with things you don't understand? And so when, when you dig deep enough into that faith, right, you understand that really you are nothing without him. He's 110% in control. You can't begin to predict which way he's going, right? You just have to trust him, right? And so, you know, God reveals himself specifically in the Bible. It is very sad. Again, I don't know where these stats come from. You know, I could, I don't know. They look like reliable sources. I don't know what they do. Nobody's ever pulled me. But the bottom line is they say that the average, you know, uh, regular church attender, whatever that is, you know, is in the Bible, you know, a, an hour a month. You know, if you think about that, what does that equate to? Well, in all these multiple service things, it's probably out there in the Bible for the, you know, 18 minutes on Sunday morning they get from the word of God. It, I don't know. But I know one thing, you are growing if you've been there one, one hour a month. You are growing if you're in there one hour a week. You know, if you're not in the word of God, he can't take you there. He can't reveal himself specifically. So many people will say to me, you talk about purpose all the time. I don't know my purpose. Well, you get on, you get in that word and you seek at God's will and you ask him to reveal what your purpose is. He's going to show it to you. So if you're not doing that, don't expect to have a purpose. Don't expect to understand your purpose. But you know, I think some people... They don't actually want to go there and do that because they might realize they actually have to do something. God's going to give you direction. He's going to show you your purpose. So he reveals himself specifically in the Bible. And then there's that personal you know, revelation. You know, um, the same account in Luke 2, we find that the angels start revealing themselves specifically to the wise men, didn't they? No guessing games there. God wants to reveal himself personally and intimately with you and with me and with all of God's people, right? So, it, and not only is it just the Bible, you know, that, that, that he reveals himself, but there's also this personal, intimate relation, you know, of, of a relational God, you know, that knows everything about us. He knows all our flaws. He knows that horrible thought you had. He knows what you did. He knows it all. And he wants that relationship. You know, you can't have any kind of relationship, um, you know, with, with God or with any other human being, unless there's that transparency, unless you can have that trust where you say, okay, uh, he knows all my dirt and he died for me anyway, right? And, and so that's what that relationship, he wants that with us. Psalm 19 says that he lays out the exact same thing for us. So let's look at Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Here we are, right, where he's generally speaking, right? The day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. Oh my goodness, I just want to cry every time I read that. He's pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run its course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, much more, oh, excuse me, more than pure gold. Where did I go? Sorry about that, guys. 
more than pure gold. Uh, they are sweeter than honey and honey from the honeycomb. It, there's nothing better, right? Nothing richer. By them, your servant is warned and keeping them, there is a great reward. But you can discern, who can discern the errors? Forgive my hidden faults. But your servant also from willful sins, may they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. I was sharing this morning how when I was a, a baby Christian, I would I would read uh, the Psalms, of course, and hear David say over and over, "I'm blameless." And I'm like, oh, I'm, not, "I'm in big trouble. I'm never going to be blameless." But the whole point is that we aren't blame. You know, we we don't have to carry the blame, right? He died for it. We don't have to carry the shame. He he, he shed his blood for it. So we know that we are if we are uh, before the Lord, we seek the Lord, we repent before the Lord. We don't carry that blame. So that was it. Doesn't mean perfection. Doesn't mean he never sinned. It means he's blameless. And guess what? So are you, and so am I. And so it will, it, it, it's all there, right? The Bible lays it out so beautifully there in the Psalms about the majesty of God, how he reveals himself to nature. So again, uh, there are three types of people. They're hostile, indifferent, and worshiping, and three types of revelation, general, specific, and personal. And then there are, you know, it's hard time, you know, putting the words as three offices, or I, I don't want to put roles there, but three offices of Jesus, if you will. So they, they finally, the wise men give three gifts to Jesus, right? We don't know how many wise men there were. We assume there were three because there were three gifts. We don't know. We don't know. There could be 103. We have no idea. But that's what we assume because, you know, we see that the three wise when they were the gifts. But the text never really says that. There were three gifts with specific meaning. They didn't just go out shopping and say, buy something pretty for the baby. No, there were very specific meaning to the gifts they brought to the king of the Jews, right? Each one of the gifts tells us something about that child, about Jesus. And I call these the three offices of Jesus. So Jesus is the king, Jesus is the priest, and Jesus is the savior. Hallelujah. So they brought Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So let's look at the king part first. It gold, right? Uh, a couple thousand years ago, gold was even less commonly commodity, you know, and kings were known for their great statues. So that it really, it was the, the kings that held most of it, right? They stashed it away um, as a, a just very valuable commodity, if you will. But the kings were known to have the gold. So when the wise men bring gold to Jesus, they're saying, this is the king of the Jews. He is a king from the time he, it was prophesied about to the time he came into this world. He's the king of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords. And so the gold symbolizes that he's the king. Not just uh, we want to bring him some money here so they can fund their road trip to Egypt. That wasn't it. You know, it, it he was a king. And they wanted to symbolize it by saying, take gold to the king. And then he's the priest. You know, they gave him frankincense. Frankincense was a, a type of incense. And this type of incense was very commonly used by the priest. It has a whole lot of cool stuff to frankincense. It actually has medicinal purposes, right? But it was symbolic of a sweet fragrance to God. You know, I, I was I was sharing this morning. I have a dear sister in the Lord. You know, she just loved this woman so much. And she is so, so spirit filled. I mean, I, I can remember being in the Southern Baptist church and I was I, you know we were co-teaching this class I'd learned so much from this woman and I'm thinking how you how you got so much spirit going on at a Southern Baptist church I don't know but she did but she told me about a couple of times when she was before the Lord some a real intense time before the Lord and she could swell smell the sweet sweetness like she said like roses like the sweetest smell you've ever heard like the Holy Spirit saying I am here I want you to know I'm here it's beautiful fragrance so uh you know the frankincense was a symbolic of a sweet fragrance to God. You know, the Bible says that our prayers are like incense in heaven, sweetness to God, right? So it was symbolic. So when they brought Jesus frankincense, frankincense, it spoke about the child who was uh, not only was a king, but he was also a priest because that's what the priests use, right? Commonly used by the priests. In Jesus culture, the priests were also uh, mediators, right? You can see, we, watching the chosen, you can see that the priests, the Pharisees, and you know, they, they, they stood between the community and God. They were the authority, right? They, they ain't nobody getting to God except through them. They witnessed to the community about God, and they, they were sure to talk about the rule book, right? Uh, and they, but they would speak on behalf of the community to God. They, he was their intercessor. So Jesus is the great high priest, the mediator between you and God. No one comes to the Father except by me. And so this is symbolic of Jesus as the priest. You don't need any of that other stuff. And to symbolize that, it was they brought the gift there, 
you know, a frankincense, that sweet aroma that was used by priests. So he was a priest. And then there's a savior. They also brought in myrrh, right? Myrrh was an embalming spice. And, and, and it's almost like foretelling, you know, his death, he's going to need it, right? When somebody died, their, bo their bodies were embalmed with myrrh. And so when you think about uh, the reality that Jesus was given myrrh at the time of his birth, it's kind of creepy, right? But they, it was prophetic, right? It speaks about his death and resurrection. Not only Jesus, the king, not only Jesus, the priest, but he's also the savior. What a beautiful picture in the threes. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have been made new. That speaks of Jesus, the savior. In my life, I never get tired of sharing it. Uh, I never will, because I, it just seems like yesterday, and it's been, gosh, forever now, but it seems like yesterday. I remember who I was, and I see who I am. I'm a new creature in Christ, and all the old things passed away, right? And so I wish I could show you a video so you could see the newness in me, that he somehow all those years ago started chasing me down he knew i would belong to him he knew that he could take a wretch like me and transform me into a vessel all things have passed away and all things have made new he's my savior so no matter what you, your history no matter uh how bad this morning was today was yesterday was last week uh, if you find yourself in jesus you know, because of his death and resurrection, then you've been made new in Christ. It doesn't matter what you've done. You know, we have a hard time with that sometimes, don't we? Like uh, you hear about deathbed confessions or conversions and and and, and the Pharisee in us says, well, that, that doesn't seem right, right? <laughs> he got to live and sin and peace, right? For all those years, to so the last five minutes of the game, we think it doesn't seem right. But, you know, once we get turned to him, there's no time factor there. You could have been born and from the time you were in kindergarten, you loved Jesus. And I'm happy for you. <laughs> I wasn't that way for me. But, you know, uh, you could also come to know Jesus on your deathbed. So he's merciful that way. And that you'll be made a brand new creature in Christ. Then 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, for he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of, of God in him. I think it's interesting. Again, we uh, we spiritualize Jesus, right? But and we we overlook the fact that he really was, you know, he was, uh, you know, a, supernaturally, you know, a, a, a virgin birth, right? But he was still in a womb. That baby was in a womb. He was flesh, right? He 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 became flesh for us, and he walked away. He, I was talking this morning about how you know he was a carpenter, no doubt. He slammed his thumb. He hurt himself. He listen. When he fasted, he got hungry too. He was living out in a flesh body to be a, a, an example, a symbol, if you will, of what's possible for us. When he got thirsty, he was thirsty. It wasn't just that he was faking it, right? He was thirsty. He felt that that human side of him was still there. So this this Christmas and every day, we have to remember that the child we celebrate, that sweet little baby there in the manger, that beautiful bundle of joy, right? He lived the, the, lived the perfect life so that, you know, uh, the, that we could never live, died the death that we deserve and rose again, that whoever would believe in him would not perish. So what, what he went through on earth for us, you know, again, uh, we, we, we don't want to not spiritualize it, but we don't want to just keep it in that little box. He became flesh. And, you know, he became flesh for us. He hurt. He died when they brutally beat him and unrecognizably uh, before he went to the cross, the crown of thorns, the stab on the side, the nails on the hands and feet. He did that. That was real flesh stuff. So people have worshiped Jesus for 2000 years and the wise will continue to do so. We will never lose sight of the fact that, uh, you know, Jesus is our king. So there were three kinds, excuse me, for the type of three kinds of people three revelations in that scripture and three offices or roles, you know, uh, of Christ there. So guys, as we face this um, in a season, we don't want to not celebrate the king of all kings and his birth, right? It's definitely, you could certainly don't want to celebrate somebody like me and not celebrate Jesus, right? But the whole thing is that lamb is the lion of Judah. And he said, you know, that, that the whole life that he led was to show us what's possible for us. And so we don't want to lose sight of that. And think about number threes and study that. You might really see some revelations for your own life. He wants to spend eternity with you. And that's it for me. So anybody have anything out there? A little encouragement, not too much toe stomping, Michael. Loved it, Lynn. That was an Thank awesome you. message. Very, very good. I love the creativity. I love the, the different spin that you put on things and the different things that God reveals to you and you bring to us. I just love it. It's it's. It shows God's creativity through you. And 
It's awesome. So thank you, Lynn. That was a great message. Thank you so much. Yeah, he does that. There's definitely original stuff, right? <laughs> and you look, I look at it sometimes, they really got, <laughs> but that's what he brings to, to drive it home. I, I think it's really cool sometimes. Thank you so much, guys. But um, I shared this with you that uh, my daddy was a storyteller. And in the South, you know, you wouldn't take offense if you're from the South when you hear this, but he would, he would say, hey, baby, come sit by me. Let's tell a few lies. What he was saying is, let's tell some stories. Let's tell some big fish stories. Let's just enjoy life together. And then my daddy lost his sight. So he got macular degeneration and he, and he couldn't see the beautiful things he talked about. He loved nature. And, and I would say, oh, daddy, I just hurt so bad for you. And he said, oh, but if I had to make a choice between my sight and my, my hearing, I would lose my sight first because I can still hear the giggles of my grandchildren. And I can still hear the birds singing. And, you know, I can still hear the stories you tell. So what I'm getting at is I, I, he was a storyteller. And uh, then when he lost his sight, I began to paint a picture for him, right? This is what their face looks like. They, oh my goodness, daddy, the sunrise. And I would tell him, you know, comparatively the colors and things like that, just to help him still see life. And now I see that that's what God's doing, right? Like he, he Jesus taught in parables with those stories and uh, that the creativity, like you said, it just comes out in a different way in me, but it all comes down to my earth father. I love so much. And he loved, he savored life. Believe me, he did. And then I became his eyes. And I told the stories. And so what a mighty God I serve. Look at the purpose and all that, right? And I think about that often. You know, I think, wow, you know, what a spirit to, um, you know, if I had to lose my eyes and my ears, I'd lose my eyes because I can still hear, you know, wow, what a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. He would have heard Judah screeching under the Christmas, uh, the women screeching about Judah under Christmas, that's for sure. <laughs> and boy, would I have painted a picture about that one. <laughs> but thank you so much. Anybody else? Then I, I just want to thank you for the message tonight. And I think that I never really, you know, you don't really think about things like you were talking about the three, the three of this, the three of that, you know, the, this three and that three, and then you bring them all together. Mm -hmm. And then it paints, it does, it paints that picture that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And like Lynn said, uh, you know, you, you just bring us so much and from a different direction, you, you show us. God's grace and mercy all the time. Uh, are there foot stamping times? Oh, absolutely. Uh, are, are there shin kicking times? Absolutely. Do we deserve it? Absolutely. But then there's times like this when, when we can just be in awe of the things that have showed up in scripture that because you're reading it you know, you're reading it over here and then you read it over here and you read it over here and maybe not all together. And then somebody comes along and says, well, did you ever look at it from here? Right. You know, and 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 it's amazing to me the, the different things that we have learned. And that's why I treasure each and every one of these Sunday evenings uh, with you uh, to go over the scriptures because. God reveals to you certain things that that come to us mm -hmm. in, a, in a manner that we wouldn't necessarily grasp on our own. Mm -hmm. and, and it gives us a view of God and Jesus and heaven and the world in general and things that we can do um, that, that make me in all, a lot of the time. Well, I'm just uh, I'm truly blessed and highly favored to be here each and every Sunday. My goodness, Michael, will you humble me? Thank you so much. But, you know, again, it's all God because he'll, he'll bring something. I'll say, wow, I never thought about that. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> then the whole thing just kind of is unveiled, you know, in my heart. And then it's it's taken out there to share with the world. But that's that's the way you know, he rolls with me and he knew, I, I just love, I just love, you know, he, he already knew my nature, right? He, he already knows who's going to, you know, be his people. He already knows, you know, there we're, it, it's predestined. He already knows. I remember when I, I first heard that when I was a baby Christian, I'm like, well, that's ridiculous. If that's true, why do I have to go out and tell people about Jesus? Well, because we're the messengers, right? Yeah. But he already knew, he knew my nature, 
He knew that my voice would be used. He knew that I used to tell stories to my daddy. And, and that's by the way, the race, way I raised my children. And they'll tell you, they'll, they'll, they can spend hours with you saying, I, I didn't say, don't do that. It's wrong. Oh, no. I sat down and I, and, I, and I painted a picture of how it's wrong and parallels of what could happen because it's wrong. It was like, that's the way I rolled. He already knew that. And so when he speaks a message there, it's him. He, you know, he puts a seed and he waters it, but he knows that, you know, I'm going to fearlessly go out and share it. He knows it. So it's all God is what I'm saying. And he knows everything about you and everything about everybody listening to this call, whether you're here or it's recorded, he already knows. So uh, the key is I, I was so grateful, you know, so, so grateful because I had, you know, mocked him and been hostile and called people Jesus freaks and, you know, <laughs> people at the airport, oh my God, you couldn't even go to the beach in a bikini and have any peace of people all over you with tracks, right? <laughs> you couldn't get away from these people. They were everywhere. And I was hostile. And so, you know, when I look at how he finally reached my heart, I'm just so grateful. I never, ever want to lose that gratitude for, for looking at that wretch and saying, but there's, I know what I want to do with that one, <laughs> you know? And so I was pretty open when I came to know him because I could see not like Paul, but a similar heart, like, you know, uh, wow, <laughs> look at God. He knew, he knew that I would be so grateful for reaching me that I would go out and do what he wants to do. But the bottom line is I'm not special. You know, he, he, it's God and he wants to do a special thing in all of us all of us. That's the key, right? All of us. And again, it's never too late. How often do you hear, here I am, my 65th birthday, and I'm just getting started. Trust me when I tell you. <laughs> yeah, the world will be saying, I wish that old lady was shut up at some point, <laughs> but I'm not shutting up. If I got to put my teeth in a jar, I'm not shutting up, okay? I'm still going to talk to you. I'm still going to do what he has me do. And again, you're stuck with me forever. So saying happy birthday for a long time, Michael, because you're stuck with me and I'm stuck with you forever. What a beautiful thought. Every year, every year, yeah. Every year. Mm -hmm. 65 is just 56 again. Like, <laughs> that's true. That's it. Just flip it around, you know, just flip it around. And somebody said, well, don't you feel old? You don't act like you feel old. And I said, I, the only time I feel old is when I look in the mirror. <laughs> you know, I can stay away from the mirror. I think I'm 30. <laughs> but you look in the mirror and say, what? Who is that? <laughs> Who is that in there looking back at me? But that's the only time I feel it. And I, and, I, and I think it's a beautiful thing because I'm excited more than anything. You know, I really am. And thinking about how productive these years are. And I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't own it. But, this, you know, I do think about the years I squandered, even as a Christian, the years I squandered. You know, I just went to church, prayed. I was happy I had Jesus, but I didn't really do anything. You know, I, I, I did the the works in a church stuff, right? I, you know, I did, uh, you know, Sunday school and I did all that stuff. I did talk to young people, talk to the old people. I, I, I did all that stuff, but that was serving in, in that local body. I didn't really get out to feed the hungry, to reach out to the poor, to, you know, speak God's word out to the world. I didn't do that. So I squandered a lot of years and um, prayerfully I'll have the, you know, years to make up some of that. Make up. But he knows my heart, right? And he knows yours. So as we approach Christmas and all the beautiful things that go with it, and we can say, Jesus is the reason for the season. Oh my goodness, you know, to ad nauseum, we can say that stuff. We need to really look at how beautiful his word is that painted that picture prophetically, right? Just painted that picture. There were three different kinds and three different revelations, right? And, and three different roles uh, that, that Jesus had and the symbolism behind all those things. He is the king. But we can't lose sight of the fact that that beautiful little baby lamb, where it's sitting at, where is it? There. <laughs> Lying in a manger. Beautiful, beautiful baby boy, bouncing baby boy, right? Becomes the lion. And he's coming back to fight. And let me tell you something. For as much as you think I share with you the, the goodness of God and all that, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to fight. And the more you do, do that, the more you see out there in the world what's really going on. And the more you see what's going on, the more you realize you got to armor up. The more you armor up, the more you want to say, I am ready to fight the dark one with the fiery darts right back in his face, right? And so it's a beautiful journey. And I just want to do my part to help strengthen his people because, you know, uh, you know, I think as you as people get older, a lot of times they'll worry more. Sometimes they watch too much news and they think the sky is falling and what's going to happen. And it wasn't like that back in the old days and all that stuff. 
but I, I, I don't do all that. But I, I look at it and say, if I'm still breathing, ooh, I was born for this time. I mean, that excites me. It really does. I was born for this battle that we're in. I was born to fight it. I was born to be like a, a Joan of Arc in the spiritual world, right? To get out there, um, you know, boldly. And uh, consequently, you, you get a lot of fiery darts. Like, um, I, I know at least one of you know that you'll, you'll struggle in your sleep. But I know that the Lord counsels me even while I sleep. Well, boy, the devil wants to get in there. He wants to whisper lies 24-7. So unless we're in the word more than an hour a month, more than an hour a week, unless we're in the world, we're, we're, we're wussies. We don't have the armor. We don't have what it takes to survive. We don't have it. We will fall. And so the time uh, is getting nearer and it's going to get crazier. Um, but I'm excited because I know I was born for this. And you were too. So what you do with it, that's a, that's that's your call. But you were born for it. Definitely born for it. Anybody else? You know, you had mentioned about the time that obviously you regret that you squandered, et cetera. And, 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 I, and I completely can relate about that. But then I look at it a little differently in that those were seasons um, that that built your testimony today mm -hmm. and God never wastes anything that oh, we no. experience. And yeah. so, um, I, I like to, I like to turn it around like that to look, because like you said, Oh, look, who was that person? Who yes. was that person? You know, and look at this person now. And so, um, oh, amen it, to that Carmen. I, I wouldn't trade it because the testimony is incredible. Yeah. But I, I also look at, though, the thank you for that. I also look at the, the squandered years as a Christian. You know, okay, so I taught Sunday school. <laughs> Big deal. Okay, I worked in the nursery because I had four kids put dirty diapers in the trash. Okay, big deal. You know, okay, I did that. And, and so, and, and quite frankly, um, I, I was part of a church teaching that that's okay, you're good. As long as you're doing in a church body, that's service. That's no, that that's logistical support, right? In a church body, you know the teaching, the true teaching, of course, has has uh, weight to it, has uh, you know strength to it. But I'm talking about the the jobs in the church. And then I realized how much more he wanted, you know, he how much more he expects. And I think when we get to that place of humility, it's like Lord, I, I can remember praying when I had that. Uh, everything kind of shifted in my life and. But, you know, I, I was praying, oh, Lord, you know, I, I just want to serve you. I still had debt. I still had stuff going on. And I, and I just wanted to say, Lord, Lord, if I didn't have to, you know, work like a hamster on a wheel, I, I could just serve you full time. <laughs> and then, he, you know, then he showed me, excuse me, <laughs> I am your full time. You take me into the workplace. It's not the other way around, right? You take me into the workplace. And so everything shifted. And I realized that I wasn't full time ministry. We're all supposed to be full time ministry. Everybody, you take your you take your faith into the workplace. That's the purpose of the workplace. Workplace purpose isn't to get you a paycheck. It, it's to take your faith into the workplace to be a witness, right? And so everything shifted for me then, and uh, it's been a wonderful journey. You know, growing and a lot of growth from that point until he finally said, "I'm using your voice. It's for me, and don't worry about anything else." And and I don't. That's all I do, right? But I love that testimony, Carmen. You know, and you know, all of it that we go through in life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, it's all meant to be a testimony. I, I tell a friend of mine who she is forever saying, Well, I just love Jesus, always have, always will. And I'm like, if you can't tell a dark world what Jesus has done for you, how are you being having any impact at all? If he hasn't done anything for you, just loved him, you're so great, you loved him. Uh, you know, what kind of witness is that? You know, it, it's even a witness to grow up in a godly home, to walk a godly life, to never have the kind of life I, that's a witness. But you still have to go out and say, by the grace of God, because of my praying grandmother and my praying mother, you have to put it into words and share it, you know, how your life is and where your life is. It's a beautiful journey. Yep. So I love the testimony. It wouldn't change a thing about my life. And it's been a cesspool more, more often than you can count. It, but I wouldn't change a thing. Because he knew, he knows it's like uh, he knew Job would you know is proclaim his righteousness. He knows who to do that with. He knows he knows the ones that are going to say, "Let me tell you about my God." 
Let me tell you about the woman I was and the woman I am. He, he knows who's going to do that. And so some of us take a bigger hit, <laughs> really, because he knows who's going to share like that. Anybody else? Okie dokie. Well, it's been a pleasure, guys. And oh, just so you know, uh, it's up in the air. Carol, she's a, a, a well lady. Um, we will meet next week. Um, definitely, we'll be meeting to, uh, next week in the evening here, too. We obviously are not going to meet on Christmas night. <laughs> I'll be loving you. When the next week's it pretty much for the year. Jury's still out. You know, the Lord hasn't spoken about uh, New Year's Day, whether we'll meet that night or not. I mean, you know, probably. So, but look out for notices, okay? If I'm, if there's nobody there, that's what the Lord said. Just keep it quiet. But anyway, with the holidays falling on a Sunday, um, you know, this, this is the way it's going to be. So, Carol, I hope to, will you be back next week? Okay, she's back next week. Praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> we didn't have music today, both of our, you know, and, and I'm incompetent, by the way. I'm like, get a video up there. I don't even know what to say. So, uh, yeah, so we'll meet next week. And, oh, by the way, uh, Carol, we're going to meet next week in the farmhouse. So come to the house. Okay, that's what we're going to meet next week. And I uh, will see you guys next week. And it's going to be a good one. Lord's already given me that message. And um, so I'm excited about it. Uh, Lynn and Carmen, I'll see you guys tomorrow. And for all the rest of you, I love you. You know where to find me uh, if you need me. But listen, as this holiday season approaches, yeah, look at the manger. Love the baby in there. But remember, he's the lion from the tribe of Judah. And he is coming back to fight. And so strengthen yourself. Be ready for the journey, okay? I love you dearly. God bless you all. Take care. God bless you and happy birthday, man. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.